Good morning and welcome once again to another in our series of Story to Tell. Today we have with us Mark Anthony Brown and he'll be sharing his experiences with us. Before we start, just to remind you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also our Facebook page. You can also become a part of our WhatsApp group and you can also promote your events and also your businesses. So, we have today Mark Anthony Brown. We're so delighted to have you. My pleasure, my pleasure. Doing fine, thank you very much. So, you could start basically with your early years in Mount Vernon. Tell us about that and your family. Well, um, I was born in Mount Vernon, New York. And um, my parents are, of course, Jamaican. Uh, they met in New York, however, I was... Um, one year old when they actually moved from New York to Florida. So my early years are really in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And the funny story is, is that when my mother moved from Jamaica to the States, when she was about 16 years old, of course she moved from one climate to another. So uh, when I was one year old, my mother decided to visit her sister uh, who was living in Fort Lauderdale at the time and um, when she realized that she could be in the United States of America in January and not need a sweater after 10 o'clock, <laughs> she quickly called my father and said, hey, um, I have your son here and I will not be moving back there. Okay. So within two weeks, he packed up everything and moved down to Fort Lauderdale. And so that's where I spent uh, my early years okay. uh, growing up. Mm -hmm. Do you have any siblings? I do. I have two younger sisters. So I am the eldest, um, which was good for me because I always had my own room, <laughs> being the only boy. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, two younger sisters, and, and they're great. So how was it um, growing <coughs> up um, in those early years? Uh, it was great. I mean, you know, my father was a, a bit of a workaholic. <laughs> I think he passed that on to me. He was a professional chef. He was the, um, he was the, I would say the head of a, of a restaurant on the beach called Breakers of Fort Lauderdale for many years. And uh, one of the most uh, memorable things I think during that time was when I was maybe around 11 or 12, he would invite me to come to the hotel on the weekends where he would get a room because he'd work late and then have to be up early. So he let me come to the hotel, stay in a room at the hotel. And during that time, there was jazz being played in a, in a lounge called the Brass Monkey Lounge. Mm -hmm. So I got to hang around John Spider Martin and, you know, Dizzy Gillespie would come through, other people would come through that were noted musicians mm -hmm. at the time. So that kind of introduced me early into uh, jazz music, which is, you know, one of my loves uh, okay. being a musician as well. Tell us more about your parents. Um, are they from the U.S. or from Jamaica? My parents are Jamaican and uh, my mom was born in um, Stony Hill. Uh, St. Andrew and my father was born in Brownstown. Okay. So, um, of course, a lot of my early years, I did spend traveling back and forth to Jamaica because I still have a lot of family, both on my mother and my father's side summer that still holidays. live here. Yeah, summer holidays uh, were spent in Jamaica. I didn't too much like the country. Uh, Brownstown because the kitchen was outside which oh. was foreign to me the bathroom was outside at that time yes. which was foreign to me um, and uh, you know TV signed off yes. at 11 or 12 o'clock which was foreign to me so you know in, in those days there's only one or two television stations mm -hmm. and at that time in my young life TV was part of my world mm -hmm. so that wasn't too um, uh, exciting for me I, I'd prefer to go to Maypen where my mother uh, uh, spent much of her, her early childhood mm -hmm. and where she went to church there and was saved at Bethel Temple Apostolic Church mm -hmm. under the leadership of uh, Bishop Nathaniel Augustus Higgins mm -hmm. as well as my grandmother. So, um, so when we went to conventions there during the summer, even though he didn't have TV, mm -hmm. but it was a bit more modern, the bathrooms were inside, <laughs> which is a huge deal. Huge deal. Yeah, huge deal. I'm not used to that. It's a very huge deal. So 
Um, I had to, uh, you know, uh, I enjoyed being around Bishop Higgins and Richard Higgins and, you know, his brother Baron would come during the convention from Darleston out in Savlamar, uh, or I should say Westmoreland. Mm -hmm. So those early days were a lot of fun. I still have friends mm -hmm. that I am in contact with uh, from those days, yes. uh, early days in Maypen at the conventions. Okay. How much older are you than your other um, sisters? And some of the responsibilities probably that you had. Uh, um, uh, I'm a, I'm a, I think I'm about a, maybe a, a year, a year, a little over a year older than my the sister that's right next to me. And then not too far. Not too far. Nah, <laughs> they got back to, to business quite quickly. Pretty quickly. Yeah. <laughs> and um, my uh, my youngest sibling, I think I'm about five years, four or five years older than her. Uh, as far as responsibilities go, um, uh, I, since my sister that was next to me was so near to me, it didn't feel much. Of, we were more like mates and playmates, and, yes. you know, in that sense. Uh, the younger sister, of course, we kind of looked out for her as well. Um, unfortunately, though, my, my father died when I was 13. No, he, uh, tragically, he, he was murdered. I actually watched him murdered when I was 13, yeah. I was waiting for him to come home from work one Friday night, and uh, one of our rituals was on Friday night, uh, we'd stay up and watch wrestling, mm -hmm. uh, which of course was fake, but that, back then it was real. <laughs> it was real. I don't care what I say. It was real. Hulk Hogan was real. Yes. And um, so, oh yeah, yeah, you know, Dusty Rhodes, Junkyard Dog, Andre the Giant, uh, Ric Flair, Macho Man Randy Savage, I could go on and on. Right. They were all real. They were all real, you know, real steroids. But, uh, <laughs> so I uh, was waiting for him to come home so we could watch wrestling together. But for some reason, this night I fell asleep. It was about 11 o'clock, I fell asleep, don't know why. And um, wrestling gets good around 11, 12 o'clock on Friday nights, but I fell asleep. And then I heard a gunshot that woke me up out of my sleep. Yes. And I ran to the window. I had fallen asleep, so I'd taken off my glasses and looked through the window, and I saw a man over my father in the driveway. And I saw when he shot him the second time. So I immediately, not thinking, just ran directly outside, ran to my father. By this time, it looked like the guy had already gotten my father's wallet, was running down the street. Mm -hmm. My dad was getting up, fixing up his pants, and I walked him inside. He fell on the floor and said, where's your mother? Mm -hmm. My mother got up. I ran and I called the police, so, you know, the ambulance 911. They were there in a matter of minutes. Uh, but when I woke up the following day, because um, I slept somewhere else that night. Um, um, I saw a lot of people at the house. Mm -hmm. And I was like, where's dad? My aunt says he's gone. I'm like, gone where? Yes, he was 13. He was 13. I said, he's gone. He, he, oh, pa that he passed away. Very that was experience. tragic. Yeah, that was tragic. So um, he didn't make it through the night, through the, you know, there was too much internal bleeding. Mm -hmm. He got shot once in the leg and, and, and once in the, um, in the abdomen. So basically it was a robbery? Yeah, it, it was a mugging. It was a robbery, armed robbery. Armed robbery. And uh, they never found out who the guy was. And I couldn't see well enough because I'm nearsighted, so I need my glasses to see far. And I didn't have all my glasses. Yes. So even though they showed me mug shots and what have you, I just couldn't, okay. I couldn't help them. Because I didn't even focus much on the guy. I was focusing on my father yes. who just gotten shot. So... Um, there was never any resolve to that, I would say, in, in the justice system. So I just had to resolve that God would take care of that. He's so you said they told you the next day your dad was gone. Yeah. But when did you actually come to grips to realize that he's not returning? Oh, that very moment. There, there was no, there was no like, there was no denial. Yes. The only thing there was like, there was a little bit of guilt. You know, they, they have this whole pyramid or, or stages of, you know, grief. grief. Mm -hmm. I just remember two stages, guilt and deep sorrow, because the guilt was I should have jumped in the car and followed, and ran, followed him, ran him over. Yes. That was my thought. If I jumped in the car, maybe I could have ran this dude over and, you know, whether he was alive or not, who cares? You At least they could have. That, that, that not legally. Oh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I just wanted to get in the car and drive the joke over. Okay, okay. You know, the car was small enough, mm -hmm. you know, so... Um, but, and then, of course, you know, my past was there. 
my pastor at the time, and uh, you know, I just bawled my eyes out. You know, it, you know, he came in and prayed for me, and um, I never, but I never had, I never had revenge in my heart. You know, I never had. I was never mad at the world. I was never feeling like, like the chip on my shoulder. I was never. I never felt that life was unfair. I think that's the grace of God. I really think part of it may be my temperament because okay. I'm a peace-loving guy. Okay. You know, my friends make fun of me that I'm a lover, not a fighter. Mm -hmm. But I'm a peace-loving guy. I want, I want peace. I don't care. Oh, so you're a Christian? At that no, time. no, no. I'm just saying my temperament. Mm -hmm. You know, I was somewhat God-fearing because my parents, you know, mm -hmm. were God-fearing. You know, I was the kind of kid that if my parents didn't come home on time, that we didn't have cell phones, so I'd call my pastor's phone. And if he answered, hello, all right, the rapture's not there yet, so I'm, I'm good to go. You understand what I'm trying to say? I was like, you know, so I knew, you know, rapture and all that kind of stuff. So, but I wasn't a Christian, per yes. se. Um, but um, but um, I just, I, I think the grace of God really helped me not go into any waywardness. Even at that age. Even at that age, yeah. I never, and you know, my mom was strong, devoted, as she still is today, Christian woman. We were the family that was at church first, you know. We were the family that was at church on time, you know, that kind of thing. And she was a strong praiser, you know. And at that time, I mean, I was, I should say, I, I, was, I was baptized at the time, you know. Okay. So Christianity for me wasn't, I hate to use the word evolution, but that, that's the best way I can describe it, you know. Um, I was still moving towards a deep commitment to Christ, and mm -hmm. you know, of course, even now, my my understanding of Christianity is still is, is still evolving in a sense. I'm still learning, but um, but you know, we were we were there, um, trusting God. I think, and I think that it was really God's mercy that kind of held our family together yes. in, in those times. You know, without without a father being there, I never got the pressure that I was the man of the house. You know, I never felt like that, um, and um, uh, but thankfully, you know, my mom, like I said, was a strong Christian woman, and the Lord helped us. And my pastor was very good; I had a great pastor mm -hmm. um, at that time, and he was very strong in my life as well. And God began to send other men in my life mm -hmm. and good friends in my life, even people that I'd consider maybe not fathers but older brothers. Mm -hmm. You know, that's when I really dived into music as well. I think that became a pastime for me or a, or a sedative for me or, a, a, you know, some kind of help for me to just channel energy mm -hmm. and, um, and not get caught up in anything that would, uh, that would destroy me. How did this um, incident affect you in school? It, 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 I don't think it did because I remember getting back to school and I was gone for two weeks and it felt like I didn't miss anything. And my academics remained the same. Mm -hmm. um, I did begin to, I think I lost some interest in academics in the following year and I can't explain why that is. Maybe I was lazy, I don't know. Um, but then in, the, in my 11th and 12th grade years, again, I dived heavily into music. I had like two or three music classes. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, music became my my go-to and then at the age of 15 I'm probably running ahead of you here but at the age of 15 you know um, I knew I had the calling to preach mm -hmm. so then I began to dive heavily into into scriptures as well mm -hmm. so between 15 16 and I actually started preaching at 15 really? yeah and 16 yeah 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 so at, at age 15 um, I received the Holy Spirit the baptism of the Holy Spirit as I understood it, and um, I, I got an insatiable appetite, really, for Bible study. Like, I just couldn't get enough of the Bible. But, and my father was a preacher. He was a great preacher. Okay, he was. Yeah, he was an evangelist. He was a preacher, preacher. And um, so one of my things was, okay, look, well, if I'm a preacher, I, I want double, you know, the whole Elijah, Elijah yeah. thing. Lord, give me double, double a double portion of what my father had, you know, that kind of thing. So. Uh, you know, and I, I remember one day in Sunday school, the Sunday school teacher was asking, well, what do you want to do for the Lord? You know, when you, what do you want to do? Uh, and I said, I want to travel and preach the gospel. That's the answer that came out of me. I want to be a traveling at preacher at 15. Mm -hmm. And 
So, you know, in my church, you know, they'd have these times where they give you time to do sermonettes or they'd say exaltation, really exhortation. Mm -hmm. You know, you get five, ten minutes to exhortations or I'd get up and give a testimony and be a little mini sermon in two minutes. Yes. And so my pastor kind of recognized that and he began to exploit that in a very good way, of course. Mm -hmm. And so by the time I was 16, I started preaching on a Sunday morning. It was just that, I guess, that obvious, you know. Mm -hmm. So that now became my that became my life mm -hmm. honestly became my life and i knew that that's what i would be doing for the rest of my life at that point so did you manage to go to a, like a bible college i wanted to but i did not um i ended up through the influence of my mother um going to nursing school nursing school yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I had to make money some kind of way. I mean, I, and in my in the, and in my circle, I we were not in a part of an organization. Mm -hmm. My church never grew larger than fifty people. Yes. Like, go to Bible school and then do what? You know, I mean, and I did. I was not. She didn't see it as a viable option. Not only not not a matter of her seeing it as a viable option, mm -hmm. but in my mind, I didn't see how I would live a life, mm -hmm. take care of myself and a potential family. Because I didn't know about the whole preaching circuit thing because I was kind of green, you know, I was a little bit sheltered mm -hmm. in this 50 member church, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, where people are barely making it, you know, if they're a pastor or whatever. So how is that going to be something that I could live off of, yes. you know, so I, I did do the nursing. I did a one year practical nursing course at McFadden Vocational Technical Center and um, passed that course. And um, in 90, end of 93 and 94, I began to to. Um, work as a graduated practical nurse while I was waiting to take the boards, practical nursing exam. Mm -hmm. I took the boards, I failed the boards. I told my boss, listen, I failed it. Um, he's like, okay, you can take it again, just continue working as a graduated practical nurse. Mm -hmm. So I was doing all the thing, you know, dressing bed sores, pushing drugs the whole nine, you know, at a, at a nursing home. All of that. I, I mean, certain things I did, I tell you off screen, brother. It's, you know, <laughs> yeah, I just, whoa, I look back and like, wow, you know. And then, you, th you know, I think I look young. I mean, at, at, nine, at 19, 20, walking into a room, you know, with a face saying, can you please excuse me? I have to check. You know, your wife just had a baby and I have to check. Yeah. Like, that kind of thing, you know what I mean? So anyway, so I was doing all that. And then I had a call to... To um, I had a call to preach at a uh, service in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. uh, a week <clears throat> it was going to be my f uh, one of my first times. This is my second time I think doing five days. Mm -hmm. I was going to be preaching in Jamaica for uh, Bishop Frank Otto, Linstead Pentecostal Tabernacle, yes. and do him first, and then after that I was going to go over and preach for Bishop Ivan W. Evans, Waterloo, Santa Cruz. Yes. At Waterloo Apostolic Church. So I said, I gotta go, guys. You know, they gave me the two weeks off. I went over to, came to Jamaica, I should say, did that week, and then I came over and did was doing the week at uh, a couple of days at Waterloo. Mm -hmm. And so one day at the dinner table, Bishop Evans says, So, um, now mind you, him and my dad were very good friends. Matter of fact, he preached a funeral service for my dad in Jamaica. We had two funeral services, okay. one in Fort Lauderdale, one at Belfield, yeah. which is where my dad is from, by the way, Belfield. Bishop Marvin Tracy is a pastor there now. So him and my dad were close. And so he invited me to preach his convention. He had never heard me preach, mm -hmm. but you know, those, those guys can get away with anything. So he had me come and <laughs> preach for him at his general convention and had a great time. So one day at, at the table, we're sitting there around all these other preachers that had, that had come. He's like, so Mark, what are you doing? What are you doing? I said, well, sir, I'm pursuing a career in nursing. He said, what? <laughs> you weren't about to look a nursing degree and God put a word in your mouth. Foolishness. Mm -hmm. You need to pursue preaching. Yes. I was like, wow, man, thanks for just, you know, telling me in front of all these people. You know, it's, thank, like that. thank you, Bishop. <laughs> you know, and uh, so when I got back to... Um, when I got back to, to um, the States and uh, went to work, I found out that uh, it had gone into new management and they had uh, fired a bunch of people. In the space of two weeks. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I was among those that had been let go because, you know, last hired, first fired. Yeah. So I just kept on preaching. 
you know that was, that was pretty much it That's and pretty I, much the I end of never career? went back to nursing it was a wrap dude so you still have your skills now don't you? it's been 25 years <laughs> i can probably put a band-aid on you <laughs> <laughs> or give you water with the you know i'm it's not, not even really sure i could give you one of the right or upper outer quadrant of your buttocks i'm not sure if i could still do that yeah. but um yeah i'd have to go back to the whole thing again but i never looked back you know and so that's it i think i worked secularly um loosely over the next two to three years mm -hmm. and of course by that time i got married in 95 okay. um at the age of 21 you got married at 21 at 21 so young yeah i met her at 18 of course i was preaching for her uncle bishop frank Otto. Mm -hmm. um my my friend who's a good friend of mine introduced me to her which was his, her his cousin mm -hmm. and i saw her and i said yep yeah, that's it mm -hmm. love at first eh? I don't know if it was love. I mean, it might have been a little bit of great attraction. Yes. You know what I mean? I'm a dude. See a dude that. Say it no more. That's how we work. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I was like, well, that's all right. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I found out, talked to her, and she's, you know, spiritual and mm -hmm. prayerful, and found out her mom and dad are prayerful and stuff like that. And, and I was like, well, yeah, this is it right here. Mm -hmm. At 18, I pretty much knew that was the one. Um, um, so, and I knew I was going to be a minister mm -hmm. and I needed somebody that could represent that. So, so, uh, three years later we were married and, um, it, it was rough first couple of years, but you know, um, economically it was rough emotionally, you know, uh, I had gotten a job where the job wasn't paying all kinds of stuff. It was just bad, but you know, went through and by, you know, I, uh, had some, a couple of secular jobs and I, and I, and I took jobs that I could remain flexible. You know, so yeah, if I get a wrong. yeah, if I got a call to preach, I'd go and preach. And by '98, the calls became to the point where I could no longer balance the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I went full fledged headlong into just you know um, traveling and preaching. And I've been quite a few places since since mm -hmm. then. Yeah. Let's go into your music life. Sure. You got introduced basically from your father back at the the hotel. And you got a love for music and also went into your music classes in high school. Mm -hmm. Where did it go from there? Well, to be honest with you, my music really started when I was about eight. Because my mom, and she knew three chords on, 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 the, on the organ. The key of C, the key of F, the key of G. And so she showed me those three chords eight. on an organ that we had at eight. That's all she knew. That's all she showed me. That's all I needed. So I developed from there. She sent me to music classes twice or so. I said, Mom, it's a waste of time. I'm not really learning because every time he goes to tell me what to do, he would play it first and my ear was so good, I'd pretend to read, but I'd really be playing back what I heard. Mm -hmm. I really should have kept with the music and if there's anybody here going to music classes, even if you have a good ear, please maintain the music. I'm 40 years old <laughs> and I still can't read music. I mean, I do have an ear, mm -hmm. you know, I can play back what I hear. But I, I think I could probably be more advanced if I uh, learn how to play by, by reading. But I can help myself. So from that time, um, a couple of years, I think, maybe a year after that, the piano player for the church left the church. Mm -hmm. And they had no musician. So yeah, so they had a musician. I raised my hand in the middle of service mm -hmm. while they were singing a song. And they were like, what is it? I said, I can play this song. I was singing that. They're like, yeah, it's a company. So that was it. I became a church piano player. Just like, that. <laughs> just like that. Yeah, just like that. So I ended up playing the piano in the church. And I learned a little bass, learned a little drums. So I play bass, I play drums, I play piano, I play organ. And um, really, the, um, the, 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 when I was doing music in high school, mm -hmm. I was really the bass player. I just fit into a niche where the bass player, he was okay. Yeah. But uh, you could read by notes, but just didn't have the feel, the groove. It was jazz, you know, and jazz is a lot of feel. So I'm like, hey, just let me hear the music yeah. and I'll give it to you, man, you know. And so I became the bass player, mm -hmm. at least one of the bass players. And then I became a part of the jazz combo, which was four of us. It was me, Matt Cauldron, Todd Del Judas, and Ken Gustafson. All of them are still in music today. And I think in 1990, we went to California. We were named the number one high school jazz combo in the nation and um, by Downbeat Magazine, and I got a scholarship to play 
jazz bass or to learn jazz bass at a school of music, new school of jazz in New York. But I didn't take it. Why? I'm a preacher. Yes. So if I go that way, I'm a backslide. You know, <laughs> you know clubs and all that, women's yeah. and all that. I ain't yeah. gonna do that. I'm a preacher. I play for little gigs around town, but brother's a preacher. Yeah. So you know, um, I just didn't even pay that any mind. That scholarship, I just kept on doing what I was doing. Mm -hmm. But my love for music just really uh, was around centered around gospel and jazz. And I think um, gospel music is one of the most difficult, not, not difficult, one of the most varying, wide varying kind of music there is because it, it kind of involves, or Christian music involves all genres, yes. you know. And so it was even from there that I got into like, you know, music producing as well. Mm -hmm. Because I like all kinds of music, but you can find all kinds of music in Christian music, Christian, you know, because yes. you have your Latinos, you have your Jamaicans, you have your Americans with the black gospel and, the, you know, neo soul and all that kind of stuff. So um, since I'm a lover of all kind of music, I think I'm just in the best place uh -huh. in terms of being in, in Christian music where I can kind of traverse the various genres without being called a heathen, at least by most people. By most people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I get to understand that you have gone on to produce albums, not only for yourself, but for others. Tell us about the projects you have worked on. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've done quite a few projects, more for independent artists. Mm -hmm. None of the big greats have called me yet. yet. Yeah, so I've done quite a few albums. I can't count them. I've been doing it for about 20 years. Yes. And um, it's been great. I think probably the only most notable one that you, you know probably that I've done an album for is, I've done a couple of them for Glacia Robinson. Mm -hmm. I think I've maybe done three albums for her. Mm -hmm. um, but then after a while, and I'm still doing albums for people, but after a while, I, um, I did a particular album for someone who wanted me to do hymns for her mother. And she just wanted me to get some. She, it, was a, it was a gift to her mother. Yeah. And she wanted me to get some of my friends together that were mutual friends of ours and do these hymns for her and for her mother. And I did the album and yeah, that turned out pretty good. You know, I rearranged these songs. You know, some of them I rearranged, some of them I kept pure. And I think it turned out pretty good. So I said, hmm. Now, normally when I go out to preach, I normally sing before I preach. My dad was a singer. My mom's a singer. Mm -hmm. You know, so I guess some of that probably fell to me. And um, I said, well, I enjoy singing. I produce albums. I need some extra cash. Yes. So uh, let me try this myself. And I was encouraged by others. I'd, I'd do some maybe one or ha one and a half minute piano vocal things for Facebook and I'd get some good responses back. Mm -hmm. And I said, maybe this is something I could do. So in 19, sorry, 2016, November, I, I released my first hymns album, mm -hmm. which did pretty well. Sold almost maybe 2,000 copies of that. Okay. And um, it went so well again, uh, it went so well that I decided to do hymns volume two which I just released at my church, Pentecostal Tabernacle in International in Miami Gardens um, last month, May 5th. And so far, I think I've probably unloaded about over 500 copies of that. So that's been something that's been a joy of mine to do. I really love music. Um, the last album has a, a kind of um, mix of pure and then I'm an 80s music lover, so some of them have a little 80s vibe, yeah. you know, ode to, well, let me not mention names, I might lose some people. <laughs> but, you know, once you hear the music, you'll say, well, that sounds like this, that sounds like that, you know. And so um, I just kind of mixed it up a little bit. And those that have bought it really seem to enjoy it. It's very, very musical, um, 16 tracks on it. So um, I've really enjoyed that. I plan to do a third one coming up soon. I plan to do a Christmas album. I've written several Christmas songs mm -hmm. for plays at my church, Pentecostal Tabernacle International, um, <clears throat> that I plan to release hopefully this coming, um, I would say October, closer to the Christmas season. And then I'm gonna go on to volume three of hymns, which the next volume, the first volume was kind of pure, more on the pure side. The second volume was pure mixed with 80s vibe mm -hmm. and then I think this third hymns album I'm going to rearrange them to have a more hill song contemporary Christian mm -hmm. vibe take the words same words mm -hmm. 
maybe alter or rearrange the melody somewhat to give them a more modern yes. uh, feel. Yeah, okay. I think that's what I want to do. Um, before we move on, can you just tell us how we could get a copy of your album for our viewers? Oh, well, right now you can download them digitally yes. from iTunes, Amazon, Google, uh, or cdbaby.com. Not sure if cdbaby.com. Yeah, you can, yeah, if it's downloaded, you, don't have to, you just download it directly from those sites. So that's where okay. uh, those are, are available. Volume 1 is available there as well, uh, as well as Volume 2. Okay. So iTunes, Amazon, and, uh, and Google. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your family that you know have. Do you have any children? Do I have children? <laughs> yes, well, I've been married. This coming August will be for 24 years. Congratulations. Thank you so much. My lovely wife, Dacia, she's still putting up with me. <laughs> and... Um, and of course, she's Jamaican as well, because okay. of course I met her here. And so, um, together we have four children. Mm -hmm. I have a 22-year-old that's now in um, the, he's in the Air Force Reserve. He just graduated from basic military training a few weeks ago. Yeah. Now he's in technical training somewhere else in Texas, and uh, he should be home sometime in September. And I still cry every now and then, because I'm just that kind of guy. <laughs> it must be a fulfilling... Um experience to know that you have grown a child and he's gone through military training and no very much so yes. i mean god gave me you know um my firstborn is you know well all my children they're great temperaments you know i i consider you know i say child rearing and, and, and bringing up children is not only what the parents do but it also depends heavily on the temperament of the child. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So, I, you know, when I look at other children that maybe other parents may have and they're having a hard time with them, I'm cognitive or cognizant to know that sometimes the reason why I'm not having certain problems that they may be having with, that, with, with their children that, that I'm having, that they're having, that I'm, I'm not having, is because of the temperament of the child, yes. you know? Um, the, all of them are mild, kind of mild. Well, the last one needs prayer, but all of them, are, <laughs> all of them are mild tempered for the most part. Is that from you? Well, I, I'm on, I'm on video now, and my wife is going to view this, so I can't just say they got it from me. Partially, I might be in trouble. They got it from the both of us. We're both, okay. we're mild, we're both mild tempered people. Yeah. You know, we're not fussy people. We're not over the top people. We're unassuming, um, kind, polite, respectful. You know. Um, both of us are that way, so I think those things have translated into the children. So my son, he's 22, I have a 20-year-old daughter. She's finishing up her third year at Florida International University, mm -hmm. and she hopes to uh, graduate next year with a degree in biology and a minor in chem. And um, I think she wants to go on into medicine, yes. but you know how kids are, they might change, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, well, that's where she is now. Yes. And then my third child, my son, he's 16. He's going to be going into a senior year of high school. And then um, my last one, my life sentence, mm -hmm. he's seven. Sixteen, seven, yes. Mm -hmm. Big gap. Big surprise. Yes. But, um, <laughs> but he's the life of the party. So um, thank God for him. <laughs> yeah, so they're great. So have any of your children um, shown an interest in music as, as you have? Uh, not as much. I mean, my, my son Aaron played f clarinet in the high school band for the past two years, but he's giving it up for his last year. Mm -hmm. He can read music, I can't. My daughter, she sings around the house all the time. She loves to sing, um, and she loves country music. Please pray for her. <laughs> and my, <laughs> my eldest son, he's a great singer, mm -hmm. very good singer. As a matter of fact, you might hear him on, a, on, a, on an album to come soon, so okay. yeah. But as far as actually playing an instrument, no, I haven't seen that as yet. Could be my fault, but I'm not going to blame myself right now. So you don't feel any way about that? Because sometimes parents tend to... No, no, no. I don't. I, I've, and I don't even know if I'm all the way on the other side. But the fact that I'm a musician, a producer, a preacher, a traveling preacher at that, I've been very careful not to try to live vicariously through them to to um, have that same drive and walk in my footsteps. I mean, they're, they're individuals. Mm -hmm. For instance, my eldest son, from the time he was 12, he's had Air Force posters on his wall. So 
should God call him into the ministry, it wouldn't be a strange thing to me. I think he's a gifted child. I think God maybe one day will do that. But for right now, I think he's walking in the path that God has laid out for him. I mean, anybody going into the military that's saved, it must be God put it in your heart because you couldn't be crazy enough to do that yourself. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he wants to be a law enforcement officer. Everything about him is about law enforcement, military. He's just that way. He's built that way. He walks that way. He talks that way from even before he got into the military. So in my mind, you know, grow up a child in the way that he should go, not the way you want him to go. But I, I sincerely believe that even if you're, when you're saved, if, you're, if you have the heart to be a teacher, I believe God puts that in your heart because he needs representatives of himself in every area of life. If you're the salt of the earth, everybody can't be in the salt shaker. That's when you're in church, you're in the salt shaker. Yes. But he wants people represented throughout all areas of society. So he'll put in someone's heart to be a nurse because he needs a representative in the hospital. He'll put in someone's heart to be a lawyer because he needs reps in the court system. He'll put in someone's heart to be a teacher because he needs representatives in the school system. So. He'll put in someone's heart to be in the military because he needs somebody there that will represent him well in the Air Force. And I think that's what God has done with my son. And I believe he'll do that with the rest of my children. Mm -hmm. So it's not for me to live vicariously to them and say, you know, your daddy's a preacher, your grandfather's a preacher, your third generation, fourth generation apostolic, come on. Eh, I'm not into that, you know. I because know to basically choose, right? Yeah, yeah. And trust that God is actually in their lives as much as he was in mine. Because I didn't get no push. My mom wasn't kicking me. You better do this. You better do that. You better do the other. She let God work through my life. And I want to do the same for my children. So, what would you say is your biggest regret in life? Ooh, man. My biggest regret in life. Uh, how would I put this without, without saying what it is? Um, <laughs> you don't have to say it. It's a nice way to yeah well i had a serious failure in my life that jeopardized my ministry jeopardized my family jeopardized just about everything and uh, that's probably the biggest regret in, in my life um thankfully i, I was um, surrounded by people that loved me back to life mm -hmm. including my family my church family my pastor so it was something like major oh it was cataclysmic it was it was i mean it was a moral failure that, that could have, you know, had I not been where I was, like in the church I was in, mm -hmm. Pastor Bobby Stewart and my Pentab family, and had I not had the wife that I had, mm -hmm. uh, you probably, I wouldn't be sitting on this couch today. You know, I'd probably in, be in England at a pub with a very, very long beard, mm -hmm. um, drinking a couple of brews, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, God was merciful and gracious, and, and uh, I think that... While, while it's a huge regret, um, I, I've learned so many things mm -hmm. um, coming out of it. And time would fail me to kind of even work out how it kind of realigned me ministerially because I had kind of gotten off track mm -hmm. in what my true calling was. And on the, on the back end of it, it kind of realigned me into my purpose. Mm -hmm. So it was a set up, set back for, it was, you know, but it really set me up to be where I needed to be today. Mm -hmm. That's how I'd put it. So it affected your family major? Yeah, it affected my marriage, it affected my family, okay. it affected my ministry. Um, I didn't preach for probably three or four years. Mm -hmm. um, oh, you had to take a break? Yeah, I took, yeah, 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 I had to, I had to. And so um, during that time, it was a very low time, um, but what can I tell you? I'm just glad I was in a place where I did not, God didn't give up on me. You know, there's a scripture that says, you know, um, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But Jesus said, I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. You know, it's not that Peter um, didn't fail because he failed miserably. And I'm not making excuses, mm -hmm. but he failed, but his faith didn't fail. And through that whole time, I can definitely say that I never disavowed or I never didn't believe that God was able to, mm -hmm. to save me or that God was able to deliver me or that God had even abandoned me for that, mm -hmm. for that moment. So um, it has realigned me ministerially, it realigned me theologically, mm -hmm. and it has given me much more compassion for people 
who have fallen, who, who are hurting, and who have need of restoration, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. As a matter of fact, um, on the back end of that particular um, experience, I did an album called Restoration, mm -hmm. which is Mark Brown and Focus. There's a group I started many years ago called Focus. And um, that particular album, I, I wrote most of the songs on that album. And you can tell in the album where I was at that time, but the words came out of me, poured out of me. And so um, I'm just glad to be on, on this side of it. But again, you know, ah, my friend was reading a book called Spectacular Sin. And it just talks about how God is able to use all things together, working together for the glory of his name and for the good of his children. Even your failures. Excuse me? Even your failures. Even your failures, because all things is all things. Mm -hmm. Failures is not included, excluded from all. Mm -hmm. All is good and bad, nice and nasty, right and wrong, you know, righteousness and sin. All is all. It's an all-inclusive word. So he's able to make all these things work together for the glory of his name and for the good of his children. And if, if God was not able to do that, um, then we wouldn't be serving God. It would be some figment of our imagination. What would you say to someone who has basically gone through a similar experience or some failure in their life and basically their family has given up on them, their co-workers probably, if they go to church, their church family, and they feel like there is no hope to try and be better because it's so bad. How would you probably encourage such a one? I would say to them, where sin abound, grace does much more abound. Mm -hmm. As my good friend would say, you know, sin cannot out sin grace, mm -hmm. but grace can out grace sin. Mm -hmm. So that simply means that God is able from wherever you are, what, whatever your circumstances, even if you're reaching up to touch the bottom, because the truth of the matter is, is that um, we have not truly, I think, investigated what sin really is. You know, sin is an infraction of the law. It, it, it's, you know, we, have to, we, we like to have degrees to sin, and I'm not saying there are not different consequences to different things that you may do, mm -hmm. but any sin is cosmic treason. I mean, can you imagine the Garden of Eden? God says, if you eat of that tree, you'll surely die. Whoa, that seems harsh, mm -hmm. you know? But what that says is that one sin is worthy of death. Yes. And even if it be a prohibition, you know, of something that seems to be so simple, you know, if you trespass or go beyond what God has said to do, mm -hmm. then that particular thing is worthy of death. And for many people who like to grade sin and grade other people because of what they have done and fail to look in their own lives, have not understood what sin is all about. Yes. Because sin is any transgression of the law. It's of omission and commission. And for, but for the righteousness of Jesus Christ, nobody could stand in God's presence. I don't care from the fornicator to the adulterer to the liar to the cheat to the white lie, you know, to the, to, to, to the little thing that you stole from work that you didn't have permission to take, you know, those kind of things or things that you should have done that you did not do. Uh, all of those things are sins and the wages of sin is still death and sin when it is finished bring forth death and the soul that sins it shall die it's always a matter of right and wrong with God he sees no gray area but the blessing we have as children of God and believing in him is that his righteousness covers all sin and we're not only saved by his death which was a propitiatory sacrifice, but we're saved by the righteous life that he has lived. Mm -hmm. And we give him our life and he gives us his life so we can stand in his presence, you know? So for anybody that's out there that's hurting and feel like you've gone too far, gone so out there, you know, too, things are too bad, things are too horrible, I would say to them, to trust in Christ, you know, trust in that 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 the that the blood of Jesus Christ has enough power to cleanse and to save, and that Jesus is not willing that you should perish, but that you should have everlasting life. And if you feel the call of God on your heart, if you feel the 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 pull of God on your heart, still to even think about Him or to have affection for Him, 
then know that that in and of itself is an indication that God is working on you because repentance does not come from human motivation. Repentance is actually a gift from God. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you feel that way, then that is, a, that is an indication that God is working still on your heart, you know? So there's no reason to give up. And again, you may fail, but don't let your faith fail because without faith, it's impossible to please God, you know? So yeah, that's, that's what I would say. What would you say it's your biggest achievement to date? Oh, my biggest achievement to date, I think, it, it, for me, it was when I saw my son um, <laughs> graduating from basic military training. I knew you would say that. Yeah, it, that, <laughs> was, that, that was amazing for me. Yeah. You know, he's becoming a, he, he, he's, be, oh man, I was a, I was a, I was a basket case the whole day. Mm -hmm. um, but see him becoming a man, that's it for me, man. I, I'm good, you know. I'm not saying for the Lord to take me home now. <laughs> but what I am saying is, you know, that was just a crowning day of achievement for me. Yes. I, I felt very accomplished. Mm -hmm. I felt like um, I've done something right by the grace of God. Mm -hmm. I should say my wife and I have done something great by the grace of God. And um, to know that we can talk, mm -hmm. we have a good relationship. Um, he's candid with me. I'm able to be open with him. Um, I know he loves me. I love him. We tell each other that we love each other regularly. Um, it's just a beautiful thing, man. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my children on a whole to me. Uh, what are some of the, the, the key tips you would give for fathers to have a good relationship with their sons? Because sometimes that's not so easy. Um, I would say, you know, be their father. Um, and that may sound, you know, redundant, but, you know, don't be their boss. Don't be their, just their um, disciplinarian. Mm -hmm. And don't, don't be their friend, <laughs> you know. Be, the, be their father. Uh, nurture them, love them, care for them, and, and talk to them. Affirm them. Mm -hmm. Let them know that you love them. And when they're wrong, tell them. And when they're right, tell them, mm -hmm. you know. You're proud of them. I, I can't tell you, I mean, losing a father at 13 uh, was, 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 was hard for me, but some of the things that, one of the, one of the things that I can remember is knowing when my dad was proud of me, mm -hmm. knowing when my dad was happy that I was his son. I don't know if there's any greater feeling than that, that feeling of affirmation, affirmation. and belonging I mean, even Jesus had to hear from heaven, this is my beloved son. In whom I will, In whom I will please, you know what I'm saying? Or this is my beloved son, hear ye him. He got affirmation from his father. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we need to also give that same kind of affirmation to our children. You know, I love you. I'm there for you. You know, learn how to drop things mm -hmm. that may seem important to you and run to their rescue. Mm -hmm. You know, run to their aid. Those things they don't forget, more than Nikes and belts and shoes and, you know, whatever you may give them, those things, you know, are, are tangible, they, 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 they don't last. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But those memories, whew, they last forever, you know. So I would say be their father, be there for them, be in their lives, you know. Even if the relationship is broken up, um, unfortunately, but don't stop being that child's father. You know, demand <laughs> that you're there, demand that you have a say. And um, I think uh, one of the greatest things, you know, the country I'm from, America, they say that truancy and juvenile problems are directly related to fatherlessness, you know. And, and as I said, growing up with that one at the time, I would thank God, God put men in my life that affirmed me. Pastor E. Gallimore, for those of you that may know David Gallimore from St. Anne's Bay, his brother was my pastor for about 20 years. And there was nothing greater to me than me preaching and my pastor's voice was the loudest voice you heard. I could preach all day. You know what I mean? You know, he's with his handkerchief, preach, yeah. preach. Or he had these little wood blocks that he used to, that you annoy me with. Don't worry about that. But you know, I mean, you know, and even when I was leaving that church to go to another church, um, the last sermon that I preached, you know, his handkerchief in his hand and he's wiping tears while I'm preaching. 
And those things don't leave your mind because you know this person affirms. Or when you lay hands on me and say, God, I know your anointing is on him, you bless him. Man, I, you can't pay money for that. Yes. Those things help make who you are, you know? Affirmation. Affirmation. And uh, I found, I, I find that, um, and Bishop Evans was the same way as well. Um, he had that same kind of um, relationship towards me, you know, affirming. And those are the things that I walk in the strength of those things, you know. Um, Paul said to Timothy, you know, stir up those gifts that was in you by the laying on of the hands. Remember the prophecy I gave to you. In other words, walk in the strength of which what's been affirmed in your life, yes. you know? And, and, and we can see in the Bible where even when it was time for the father to pass away, he wouldn't pass away without blessing his children, yes. without laying hands on them and telling them who they are. And, you know, and even God sometimes would prophetically speak in their voice. So I think, you know, more, 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 than, more than pastors, more than pastors being a, 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 an influence in, in children's lives, I think fathers should be the great. I should be the greatest influence in my children's life, yes. period. Because I'm the dude that's there every day. I pay the bills, <laughs> you feel me? Yes. So <laughs> I'm the one that should have the greatest influence. You know, even when it comes to my daughter, you know, she wouldn't mind me saying, she doesn't talk to me much as she talks to her mom. Hey, and that's fine. Certain things I really don't want to know. Yes. You know, I just can't handle. <laughs> But at the same time, sometimes I push my way in there. Yes. How, what's this? What's going on? Why this? Why that? The other? You know? Because I'm the first man in her life, you know? So that's what I'd say, you know, be a father, you know, affirm, you know, strengthen, you know, nurture and guide. And I think, um, you know, once you've done that, then you've, you've done well. What do you do in your spare time? When I have spare time? <laughs> yeah, when you do have spare time and I'm traveling and preaching and doing all um, do you like sit and watch movies? Yeah, I, I, li I, I do like to watch movies, and I'm the kind of guy that can watch the same movie five or six times. My wife hates it, but it's just me. You watching that again? Even my kids, you watching that again? Paul Blart, Mall Cop again? Yeah. Yes, I'll watch it the 17th time. Yes, I'll watch Titanic 45 times and still get mad at Rose for not giving that guy space. I mean, I've seen diagrams. Jack could have fit on that board. We're not going to go into that right now, Mike. Emotional. I've seen it too many times, but so but I like movies. I like um, I do like listening to audiobooks. Um, I like I like looking into different musical gear, seeing what's new on the horizon, tech wise. Um, and I love food. Yeah, what's your favorite food? Tell us about the food part. <laughs> Anybody that knows me on Facebook knows that I'm a foodie. <laughs> yes, and lately. Um, not to not to not to my health, but I really you know I love Italian food. Mm -hmm. You know I've been really getting into spaghetti and meatballs, just the purity of it. Just you know I've been going trying different places. I think I found a place that has the best spaghetti and meatballs yes. and garlic bread. You know, of course. Well, yeah, that's another story. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's a gulf fix between me and the floor, but um, yeah. I, I do enjoy food, and because I travel so much, mm -hmm. I do get to visit a lot of different places and restaurants and, and enjoy myself that way. So, um, you know, and I like caviar, I like escargot, you know, I like to try different things. I like um, sushi, mm -hmm. um, you know, so, yeah, I, I think those things pretty much sum me up. I don't mind being by myself for long periods of time. Of course, when I'm in the studio, I'm in the studio myself for long periods of time. Yeah. So, and one of my pastimes really is music. music. I, I just love doing music. I love playing music. I love rearranging songs. I love writing songs. I love the whole from start to finish. You know, I get tired doing it, but I never get tired of it. You know. In closing, could you just give our viewers a word of encouragement as we go? Ah, <sighs> well, I know all kinds of people will be watching this video. Those that are probably you know, Christians, those are probably not Christians, but if I'm a preacher, then I got to kind of lead on that side. And um, my encouragement to you would be to trust in Christ. Um, that's the best encouragement I could ever give. Um, it's Solomon that says in Proverbs, you know, 
Um, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Uh, the pathway of life is very brief on this earth. Um, I think it's Moses that said, um, Lord, teach us to number our days that we can apply our hearts unto wisdom. And we have a three score and 10 span. By reason of strength, we get four score, which means we're allotted 70. And if God spares us life, we get 80, sometimes 90. But in relationship to eternity, it's but the snap of a finger. It's but the grain of sand on a seashore. So my encouragement would be for you today is to put your trust in Christ. Um, life is going to be filled with many different challenges, with ups and downs. Life is going to be filled with good times and bad times. But the, the, the thing that remains constant throughout all of these different challenges is if you have Christ, you're able to weather whatever storm may come your way. So if you're outside of Christ, I would encourage you today to embrace him, to, to look towards him for help, for strength, for salvation. And if you are in Christ, I'd encourage you to stay, to abide in him, for there only will you find life, everlasting peace and joy. And I would say grace and peace be multiplied unto you. Okay. Thank you so much, Mark, for sharing your time with us. We do enjoy your interview. And we hope that your words will encourage somebody that's out there. Thank you so much. My pleasure. All right. Thank you so much for staying with us another time. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to wow, make it cool. dark. <laughs> oh, you need drugs? <laughs> Say no to drugs. <laughs>